Welcome back to CISO Life, brought to you by Side Channel. You can follow us anywhere on social media using the hashtag CISO Life. You can follow me down on Twitter or on LinkedIn down below. And of course, hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube. Wanted to go over today recent news around the Uber hack. I almost said Twitter. Man, what's going on these days? So we do know that on September 15th, Uber came out and was notifying everyone that they had an incident. And in order to kind of dig into that, we, of course, turned to social media. And what did we find? A number of things. Social engineering, access to re re remote access and via VPN, social engineering to be able to get to that point, scanning of an internal network, and then eventually lateral movement after compromising what looks to be, and sounds like, based on what's been put out so far, the hard-coded passwords uh, within an environment, which then led the attacker to get to a larger privilege access management system known as Thycotic. So I'm going to walk through basically how does that look? What does uh, what does that kind of you know entail? Let's just say, for instance, there is no on-prem infrastructure for Uber.com. Um, we know that the corporate Uber environment was what was compromised based on what has come out. And we know that it started from a single individual uh, who was social engineer. So how does that happen? Well, we have an individual, right? We'll say here that has working for Uber, Uber and they are uh, unfortunately taken advantage of. So what it looks like happened was a bad guy. We'll just go over with our other other folks. So turns out looks like evil by <laughs> evil guy did some social engineering on um, this employee. And what happened was he was able to send a number of MFA push notifications using SMS to this individual on a constant basis. And based on the uh, graphic that was shared, the um, SMSs were taking place over an hour. He then called this person on the phone, masquerading as a help desk employee, that employee, and said, hey, listen, if you, you know, want these SMS messages to stop, you need to accept this, and then, you know, we'll take care of everything. We don't know exactly what was said, but it seems like that's the semblance of the idea. The employee did, in fact, approve. The attacker was then able to um, add his or her device to the MFA solution and then logged into the VPN that was able to give him or her, we don't know, him or her, him or her access into the actual environment. So now that the attacker has access into the environment and is sitting within or whatever Uber's uh, corporate environment structure looks like, they then begin looking for data within the organization and scanning for file repos, databases, whatever they could have accessed and started looking for these pieces of information or on file shares. It's the best folder I could draw for you right now. Um, and looking for information. What the attacker was able to come up with was a PowerShell script that had inside of it hard-coded password. And inside of this document. That then allowed the attacker to move and use this hard-coded password, supposedly, to access a major system within the Uber environment called Psychotic. And Psychotic is what's known as a PAM, or a Privileged Access Management System. Essentially, it's a vault of all of your passwords and only a chosen few people inside of an organization should have access to this. Why? Because it literally has all the keys to the kingdom. So now with the attacker being able to leapfrog into Thycotic and the PAM, they were then able to use Thycotic to be able to then access 
all other things within Uber's control environment. That includes their AWS environment, their GCP, their Google environment, their Google Drive, their Slack, even some of their security platforms such as HackerOne and Sentinel One. And this is where all of the screenshots were coming out and being shown. And obviously we've just posted, we'll post what those are. But you see here this, you know, who knows if there was a setup or recon to be able to do this. There was obviously reconnaissance done by the attacker to determine, look at this individual that started it all. And then obviously being able to leapfrog and using lateral movement after accessing the VPN into the actual Uber environment was able to then move, gain more access, move, gain more access, and then eventually got to what looks like uh, the target. Now, who knows if this was the target, the end state, or if they just got lucky and just kind of keep kept, you know, trading up, if you will, and accessing and accessing and seeing what they could go do. But this does seem to be, based on the information that came out, this looks to be what happened with Uber. And hopefully this is informative. We can kind of see where there are some breakdowns here. And let's maybe just take a look. What are the breakdowns within the Uber hack based on what we know? Well, for instance, one, the user had limited training maybe on what to be looking for when getting a significant amount of SMS pushes, pushes to their phone or to their device that would have then enabled and allowed for MFA. So somehow the you know user, the hacker, had access to the username, potentially, and then MFA was the second factor to then be able to log in. Don't know. We're unsure about that right now. But what we do know is that the SMS was uh, you know pushed. That was out there. Um, the hacker did you know allude to that and put that out there as, as part of information that was found post breach. So that's very interesting. So you know how do we train users to look for this? That's very important. Why are we using SMS? So SMS is, you know, it, it is a valid form of MFA, although it is obviously a weaker one. Now, for most organizations, it works. But for maybe information or access into certain things or larger organizations and enterprises, perhaps SMS or push notifications are not the way to go. So definitely something to probably be re-looking at on your MFA implementations. Um, was there a second challenge of any sort? On the VPN, you know, was was MFA the really the, the the last line? You know, there are technologies, there are ways to second and third challenge an individual. Hey, I've never seen you log in, even though we're using MFA. I've never seen you log in from this area before. Uh, maybe I should challenge you again before I allow you access into the environment. But I think the coup de gras really is hard coded passwords inside of a PowerShell script that sat somewhere on a device or on a share that the attacker was able to find. That just seems like a horrible no-no because that led to the eventual compromise of the actual PAM, the Privilege Access Management System. And that seems to be where it kind of all fell apart. If this was not uh, found, what damage could have been done? Could other things? Maybe, who knows? It might have been harder. Maybe Sentinel-1 uh, would have uh, found more malicious activity, maybe other capabilities inside of Uber, who knows. But this seems to be the piece that really unlocked it for the attacker. Once they were able to get into the master vault that is a PAM, they were able to then leapfrog right into all of the other systems. I mean, this really becomes an area that you need to, if you have a privileged access management system, really need to tighten up who has control, where is the control, and please, don't hard code passwords and write passwords down. This is the digital version of writing it on a sticky note and putting it either on your monitor or under your keyboard. We all know it's there. Stop. Well, that's a good breakdown, I think. If you have any questions, drop some comments down below. Drop some questions down below. Hopefully you found this insightful. I'm Brian Hoagley with CISO Life, brought to you by Side Channel. And I look forward to talking to you again. Be safe. Be good. I'll talk to you next time.